Hi and welcome. As always, I'm Abby. This is Stories Lived, Stories Told, and here's my question for today. What is the impact of whiteness in my life? This question is one I have been considering since speaking with our two conversation partners today, Diane Grimes and Liz Cooney. Diane and Liz are the co-authors of the upcoming book, Through the Lens of Whiteness, Challenging Racialized Imagery in Pop Culture. In this book and in much of their other work, they consider the ways that we make meaning around race and how that meaning is reinforced in the media we consume. I invite you into this conversation, whether race and its impact on your life is something you consider daily or have never thought about before, especially if you are white. One way to think about this topic is to say that whiteness is to us as water is to a fish, right? Like we don't pay attention to it because it's just the water we swim in. We might not know anything different. We might never have thought to question it. As I consider the question of what the impact of whiteness in my life is, I don't yet have a fully formed answer, but I know that the process of beginning to become aware of whiteness is about looking at the water I swim in. So this metaphor starts to fall apart a little here because the difference is we can actually change the water that we swim in, so to speak, unlike a fish, right? We can look at the effects of race in our world. We can consider the meaning we make of it and begin to make different and new meaning around it. In part two of this conversation, which you can come back and join us for next week, We'll really get into Diane and Liz's book and the ways they're inviting us into this conversation. Today, though, in part one, we're going to get to know Diane and Liz a little bit first, um, hearing some of their stories and diving into the importance of building awareness as a first step and what that looks like and then what it means to follow that up with curiosity. As always, this conversation is us taking a communication perspective on the issue of whiteness There's so much richness to be found by considering the way we communicate about these ideas, and I hope that you'll be able to see that in this conversation. In Diane and Liz's sharing of some of their own experiences, I also hope that you'll feel that this is a safe space to lean in with curiosity, whether you have already begun the practice of building awareness in your life or if you are just beginning. So without further ado, let's begin with Diane and Liz. Hi, Liz and Diane. Thank you so much for joining me for this conversation today. Hey. Thanks for having us. We're excited to be here. Good. I'm excited too. And to start, I'm wondering if you can give us a little context about each of you, maybe share some stories or introduce yourself. Liz, would you want to start us off? Sure. So my name is Liz Cooney and I hail from Iowa, Des Moines, Iowa which a lot of people refer to as flyover country, but I think it's a pretty, pretty great place to be. It's, it's home for me. And my story, I guess one of my stories is that I grew up in a, in a family full of journalists. And so your podcast, the topic of stories and the stories that we tell and everything like that, I can really relate to because I think I was I was surrounded by people who are storytellers, who wanted to know the truth, who mm-hmm. are curious about how people live their lives and the, the interesting things people do and are passionate about. I did not grow up to be a journalist, although I, I feel like I'm journalist adjacent because yeah. I have two degrees in communication. I studied rhetoric and my my I, I'm a writer and my current work right now is all about communication and it, it's in the the business world, the corporate world, uh, coaching leaders on how to communicate more effectively and how to how to relate to one another in a way that is more effective. So I I'm really thrilled to be here. I'm excited to talk with you and and um and Diane about our project and just dig into some of the stories that Diane and I looked at in in the process of writing this book. So that's a little bit about me. Perfect. That's a great start. Diane, what's some of your stories? 
Well, so one of my stories is I lived up north for the first nine years of my life. So I was born in Rhode Island, and then we were in uh, Wisconsin and Minnesota. And then I moved to Kentucky. And um, I remember thinking as a nine-year-old, they don't know that the Civil War is over here Mm. because there were so many Confederate flags everywhere. And I was just kind of like, wow, this is really different. So I feel like for me, um, I felt like an outsider in some ways um, in various uh, situations. So our family was um, Unitarian Universalist, and that was uh, not really understood in Kentucky. So I would always kind of just keep it quiet. And, you know, I didn't really talk about my, uh, my church life or whatever. And related to that, my partner is African-American. So there's, you know, sort of that layer of the story where, you know, you have to decide whether whether and what to say about it. So, for example, as a professor, when you're talking about race and I teach a class in critical whiteness studies and a class on diversity. So, you you know, you have to decide uh, what you're going to say, if anything, and how you're going to talk about the, you know, those kind of. Uh, background stories, which of course are very important and inform all the things that we're talking about today and, you know, how you go about teaching a class like that. And so that kind of uh, insider outsider dynamic has been, has been something that's, uh, that's kind of been important for me over the years. Yeah, absolutely. And you teach at Syracuse now? Yeah. In the Department of Communication and Rhetorical Studies. Yeah. Well, I know, you know, we want to talk about the better social world and get more into depth in this book, but maybe to start, you could share a little bit about where the idea for this book came from and the collaboration between you two and give a little bit of an introduction to what it is for people who don't know yet, since it will be coming out shortly, but is not out yet. So this is something that I've been interested in for for many years. Uh, my training is not in uh, like visual culture or any of those kind of aspects. My my training is actually in critical organizational communication, but this was something that I've been interested in for a long time. So I actually wrote in graduate school. I was taking a I think it was a philosophy class, but I got really off and interested into these Planned Parenthood ads that I had seen in the school newspaper. And my professor was kind enough. He was like, yeah, you want to write about that? Just yeah, knock yourself out. So this was like a visual analysis of these ads and, you know, sort of how racial ideas were playing out in the ads. And so this has been something I've been interested in for a, a pretty long time. But the particulars of the book, um, I think, came about because I was in a... I'm not exactly sure what it was. It was some kind of whiteness awareness group. It was like a six week course or something like that, or a work series of workshops, something like that. And so I was kind of on the edge of it because, you know, I have, I do have like a pretty big background in looking in, uh, you know, working with whiteness stuff and thinking about whiteness. So it was one of the things that came out of it was, you know, it would be really nice for the people who are in this kind of group. So they've started thinking about whiteness issues, but they're not too far down the path. And so what would be some very um, concrete and sort of practical things that they could look at and think about um, that would, uh, you know, get them a few steps further on their journey. And so I was thinking about that. And then I was thinking about some of this visual stuff. So I have like several uh several papers that looked at various aspects of visual culture. And then I was thinking about Liz because she was graduating out of our master's program. And I knew that she had done work um, on the Peace Corps and like the white savior complex and all this stuff that was uh, looking at Instagram uh, posts that were, you know, were visual. Mm -hmm. So I just literally just emailed her and was like, hey, this is a crazy idea. Do you want to meet? And you know, talk about this and see if we want to put together a book because we seem like we already have some chapters. Yeah, so that's that's how it started. And Liz, probably you want to say a little bit more about it. Yeah, absolutely. So I, just to take off from there, I think 
you know, Diane and I hadn't hadn't worked together professionally. So even in the master's program, um, I didn't study with Diane or anything, but but we had connected in the hallway and I knew that she she taught around mindfulness and communication and whiteness. And so we would just chat in the in the building about some of these topics that I was curious about and studying and she had had been working on as well. For for me, you know, this work comes from again a, a personal lens. I think that's true for for many of us when it comes to race and our journey with trying to understand our history and the complexities of how we are trying to do anti racist work and and unravel a lot of the harm that's been done um, in our own lives. But you know how to not perpetuate that going forward and. I studied, as Diane said, a, a lot of the visual images on social media. And when she approached me to to do this collaborative project, it, it seemed like a no brainer because of the work that she had done as well. And and this was back in 2019. And I want to I want to point that out because yes. we we have worked on this for over four years and mm-hmm. uh, naively thought that oh we'll crank this out in six months and have this published <laughs> within a year, right? Yeah. <laughs> And I will say we 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 worked very quickly every day, especially that first year. We were just so gung ho and had no idea what was about to hit our society in 2020, both with the pandemic, but also with George Floyd's murder and the absolute rupture in especially white people. Even though Black Lives Matter had been around since 2013, mm-hmm. it was it was almost like people were hearing about it for the first time. Yeah. And we watched closely. We kept writing. We we kept pushing out drafts and manuscripts, getting reviews done, finding a publisher, because we knew that this work was so important and relevant. And even though it's four years later, it's just as relevant and yeah. needed. And there's always images being created and produced. And I know we're going to get into that here in just a moment, but mm-hmm. I think this collaboration just makes a lot of sense. Diane and I work really well together. We have different strengths when it comes to the writing process and the storytelling process. And we each have very different backgrounds. And so I think we we do bring an interesting perspective because of that different generations, different lived experiences and and different examples that we brought forward throughout and continue. I just sent her another image yesterday that I <laughs> that I came across during work and I was like, "Look at this. It is it's all white. Like what what is happening?" And you know, you just you don't unsee these things once you once yeah. you notice them. Well, I think that's definitely a, a helpful place to start. So jumping in, as I said, the way I want to frame this conversation is by thinking about kind of where we are now and what what our better social world looks like. So kind of saying, here we are, that's where we want to be. How do we get from here to there? So Diane and Liz, I'm curious how you would define what a better social world means to each of you. Uh, I don't know. (laughs) It's a huge question. It is a huge question. I'm going to I'm going to continue to anchor it in the book just because sure. that's why we're here. So what does a better social world look like? So the the title of our book is Through the Lens of Whiteness: Challenging Racialized Imagery in Pop Culture. For me, the answer to that question is a more just world. And what does a just world look like? It means understanding the complexities of where we are in the present moment, so that we don't perpetuate harm and stereotypes and hate and bigotry and racism going forward. Wow. That's so interesting because I want to make it really big. Like, I don't want to anchor it in the book. Um, Not because that's not a good idea, but I don't know. Somehow when you had asked this question earlier, I was just thinking, it's so big, but in some ways it's very straightforward. And you know what would be helpful to me if we want to make better social worlds is if we could see other people as fully human. That would yeah. be really a good 
start. And when we start really looking into all of the stuff that we look into in the book, I mean, that's part of the thing that I feel like I kept on saying, and we kept on saying, like, you know, there's impact of these ways of seeing things. And part of it is we don't see other people as fully human somehow. Mm -hmm. And and then if we don't see people as fully human, then we can perpetuate all kinds of things onto them, right? Because then it doesn't really matter or they're, you know, they're bad people or they're evil people or they're stupid people or they're, you know, or, but I mean, I think at the bottom, it's like, we just don't see people as fully human. And so um, there would need to be a lot of things that would need to change if we were to do that. Right. I mean, I hesitate to say the word capitalism right now. <laughs> right. You but can. I mean, so how do we, yeah. you know, how do we make a world where everybody matters and, you know, People who have too much don't need all that stuff, but other people don't have a place to live and they don't have enough food to eat. And, you know, mm -hmm. they live someplace that's not sustainable now because of climate change. And then the whole layer of climate change is on top of that, right? Where people yeah. are greedy and people want to make their money and they, you know, they don't care what happens in 50 years. And, you know, yeah. you have, a, and it's systemic, right? Like you have a whole system that's, sh that's set up on short-term you know, um, making money in the short term and not taking a longer view. And which which brings me around to the whole notion of like, you know, whose whose values are we following? Right. Yeah. Like the, the notion of just going back to seeing everyone in, as fully human and really fully understanding that. And then not just that, but then making the changes that you would need to make for uh, a world that would fully reflect that. Mm -hmm. that's that's how i would see making better social worlds yeah not just social worlds but like worlds yeah yeah right because the the material world and the you know survival world is connected to the social world mm -hmm. yeah i think the question kind of demands that you look at it from both perspectives the big picture as well as the minutia of it all because you do want to say everybody's full humanity or, you know, oh, climate change is part of this issue and all of these kind of larger ideas. And at the same time, you want to work in from the other end to say, and it looks like the language that we use and the way we interact with people and the images and get into more of that detail and kind of come at it from both ends. Right. You have to know how it works. Yeah. And that's yes. where the supposed minutia comes in because right. all of those larger things, you can't understand how they work unless you get into the details of it and you look at mm -hmm. things closely. It's important, I think, to use imagination and hope as like tools to envision what the better social world could look like, to not be conservative, you know, in your vision of what a better social world could be and to imagine great equality and justice and, you know, a healthy planet and not huge gaps in wealth disparity anymore and things that don't really feel I don't know, like they'll ever happen in my lifetime, but it's worth like imagining those and still having those as the end goal. As long as like you're saying, you're doing the little things every day to be working towards that and not just saying, oh, gee, I really hope we can have a just society, but not taking the time to learn how to have the little conversations along the way that actually inch us towards that. And that's kind of what I see your book is doing is that like you said, maybe there are people that are already in these spaces that want to be doing anti-racist work or considering their own whiteness and the ways that that plays um, out in their lives. But maybe there's people that really haven't considered that, even with everything that's gone on the past four years, like you're referencing, even with the entire racist history of the United States, there's still so many people, white people, who are not having those conversations. And I think it's a really hard, or it feels really challenging for people to make that step over from not having the conversations to having the conversations if they don't feel equipped to do so. And so that's kind of, I see your book acting as a bridge for people to give them the tools to start having those conversations because there's not easy conversations. No, it's not. And I would add to that, it's it's not only difficult to have the conversations, it starts with awareness and the willingness to even explore the conversation. Yeah. And it's such a spectrum because that's one of the major privileges of whiteness is we don't have to think about it 
every day. We mm-hmm. can go about our lives and we can think that the world is pretty just as it is because we don't deal with the harm and the perpetuation of racism in a way that negatively impacts our day-to-day lives. Right, right. And we don't have to think about it. We don't have to have these conversations. It has to be intentional. There has to be an awareness of the need to understand, dissect, and really get into how this personal experience has a larger impact on our systems, our policies, our our ability to move forward. And I think that that's one of the biggest challenges in delving into these topics is there's plenty of white people that are still in total denial that this is worthy of spending time talking and writing about. Mm -hmm. There's still a lot of the dualistic thinking around it. And I I just think we have to both meet people where they are, because if we try to have this conversation with folks that are not even close to even that awareness, then it's all lost. It's going to go completely in one year and out the other, so to speak. Um, and so that that requires different language, that requires a different conversation than those who have been working on it and are aware. And we can have a different conversation as to what this means and what this um, can have an impact on in, in our world. But it's it's very complex. We can't we can't always you know have the conversations that we want to because people are are at different points yeah. along this spectrum in this journey. Yeah. I'm curious about each of you. I don't know if you can, you know, whittle it down to a single moment or story, but if you remember what when the awareness kind of clicked on for you in your life, if it was maybe a time in your life or if there is a specific story you could share about that. Well, I would say there's many there's many stories and there's many click click points, right? Yeah, like, yeah. Because there's, it's a long, long learning curve. Mm-hmm. But, um, I was going to say for me, I think when I started um, in graduate school to understand the social construction of reality, mm-hmm. then I was how I, like, you know, my brain was exploding because I didn't, you know, I mean, before that, I just sort of thought, well, there's just reality and, you know, every, yeah. Reality- and there's it's just one thing and maybe some people have it wrong and you know but in general it's just one thing and so to to understand that you know we in we create our own realities out of our assumptions like that changed everything for me Mm -hmm. also from a justice perspective right because it's like okay if we made this world then we can change this world and if we we assumed this world into the form that it's in, Mm -hmm. then we could assume it into a different form. That was a huge upside for me because I was like, okay, this is amazing. Anything is possible. But to go back to what you were saying before, it's, it makes the conversation harder because you can't just go to the people and be like, Hey, look at this dove ad. This is crazy. Um, Because then you have to be like, okay, but, the reason it's crazy is because, you know, here's the the details of this particular, you know, ad and this particular story. And here we think what's harmful and, you know, why it's problematic, blah, blah, blah. But you also want to be like, okay, but because reality is socially constructed, da, 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 right? And so when you teach a 15, 14 week class on critical whiteness studies, you know, you feel like you have time to lay all that out. But when you're talking to the people at the park who are looking at the monument and you know, yeah. you know hugging the Indian statue in a disrespectful way and you try to say something, right? Like you can't really pack all of that into a short conversation. And so that's what makes it difficult. Liz, do you have a moment of awareness that you can recall? I do. And I, I want to give a little background as to while I have that moment, I think it's still a complex moment because I grew up in Des Moines, Iowa, and a lot of people probably assume, wow, there's no diversity in Iowa. It's just a bunch of corn and pigs. I grew up in the city. <laughs> I've never lived on a farm. And yes, 
there is the majority white people in our population. Uh, but I went to public schools. I went, I lived in the city and diversity in terms of racial and ethnic diversity was all around. I went to a high school that we had 23 different languages that were spoken because a lot of people don't know this, but Des Moines is a, is a big home for immigrants and refugees. And this, this has been part of our history for the last 30 or 40 years with our former Governor Ray, who, who really tried to create a safe space for immigrants and refugees. And so I was exposed from elementary school on to folks from different backgrounds and, and different cultures and, and different races. And so I, I had friends who were Bosnian and who were from Sudan and from Mexico and who were Black. I, I mean, I I had that exposure early on and it was integrated into not just my schooling, but my social life as well. I grew up as a as a Girl Scout. And one of the things I distinctly remember was some of the activities we did around learning about other cultures and uh, experiencing food and dress and music in a very intentional way and bringing in guest speakers to, to learn about that. I was privileged to go on a a foreign exchange program in seventh grade to our sister city, Kofu, Japan. And that exposed me to, to more cultures and, and difference. And so I was raised, I think, with a lens of curiosity around difference. Yeah. And at the same time, I still was centering whiteness and everything that I did unknowingly. And uh, I had that lens, of course. And it was, it wasn't until after college that I had this shift in, in awareness because I think I had a pretty typical upbringing when it comes to white privilege and not having to talk about race. And even with exposure and diversity and having this community around me with uh, school and church and scouts and all of that, it was it was pretty stereotypical white. And I think when I went into the Peace Corps, it was, of course, with great intentions. It was to make the world a better place. I won't go into all of the details around my experience there, but it didn't take me very long to realize something is wrong here. Something is wrong with the approach to what I have set off to, you know, endeavor or or to accomplish. And I didn't have the language around it. Mm -hmm. So to Diane's point, we do create our worlds, right? And we do that through language. We do that through the stories that we tell each other and the stories that we tell ourselves. Oh, yeah. I left the Peace Corps early because this rupture for me as to what was going on, why I went there in the first place. Um, sorry, I served in Rwanda. Mm -hmm. Give you some context around that. It, it was. It just became increasingly unsettling to me that I thought I could go into a country that I had three months of training in the language on, was learning the culture as I was living in it and the values and the norms. And I was fresh out of college. I, I did not have any actual skills, practical or professional to, sure. to be there. And so without getting into the the issues that I have around <laughs> international development to begin with. I left there without the language to to describe why I was so unsettled and uh, my choices of being there were were causing this change in me. And it wasn't until I went back to school about eight years after that experience and was studying at Syracuse and was able to to really explore the depths of what transpired for me. And I had come across the the term white savior mm -hmm. 
when I, when I came back from the Peace Corps. And so that started to make sense for me. I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And then I started to notice how much white saviorism is part of our culture. Mm -hmm. And it's really looked at as a positive thing in our movies Mm -hmm. and our stories. And it wasn't questioned. And this, this was back in, you know, 2010, 2011, like, there just wasn't that conversation around these, it was still being produced. I mean, it still is today. But that started to make me realize, okay, it is my whiteness that allowed me to go into that space. It's my whiteness that allowed me to think I as one individual can show up and think that I'm capable of making a change in somebody's life, whether or not they asked for it, whether or not they wanted me there, whether or not they had a desire to pursue Western development goals didn't matter, right? It was all about me and my journey to not only go over there and do the work, but be perceived by others as doing this work. And so that got into the images and how I was drawn to that work through the way Peace Corps marketed things. Uh, This was back, you know, there wasn't a ton of social media. Instagram didn't exist back then, but we had a recruiter come to my college and they had a big PowerPoint presentation with glossy slides with all these people who looked like me and they were serving and giving back and traveling the world. And I mean, who wouldn't find that appealing, right? Mm -hmm. And so when I got to Syracuse, it was, it was this combination of my lived experience the term white savior, and then understanding this theory of critical whiteness and critical race and how we can examine those experiences and we can do better and we can understand how we got to where we are. And for me personally, it was it was an unraveling of how that transpired for me and then what that means going forward, you know, how to how to not continue that. So that's a really long winded answer to your question. But I I just think, you know, these, these topics are complex. There's not just Mm -hmm. one moment, there's not one particular thing that really defines this about our journey. It's, it is the connection of those moments that builds and continues to to give us insight into our own stories. I think it's great that you went so in depth in that story because again, like this storytelling is such an important part of it. I don't know, some people might feel a little lost or not sure how to enter into the conversation if we're talking about different theories or um, critical whiteness or, you know, some of these bigger concepts. Again, if your awareness is not already at the same level that maybe the two of you have to be able to say, well, this is what it actually like looks like played out in my life. And this is the story. And this is what I experienced. This is what it made me feel. This is what it made me think. Think people can relate to that better. But the thing I was thinking in both of your answers, which you talked about social construction and the, our role in our world is that it's this letting go of the idea that there's like an objective truth or way of being or quote unquote way things are in the world, letting go of that in favor of understanding how meaning making is a subjective experience. And it is something we are always doing, whether we're aware of it or not. And Diane, I loved what you said. I think that's that was such a crucial point for me in being able to be aware of more things that I was originally not growing up because of my experience um, being vastly different than Liz, Liz's experience of not being exposed to great diversity early on in my life. And so part of the awareness came for me when I even learned about, you know, meaning making or social construction as an idea of this is how we interact with the world. And that was so different than what I was being taught, which is that there's like objective ways of being almost, or there's, you know, kind of black, white, I don't mean that racially, but you know, in the way of like good and bad, right and wrong, the picture is very black and white, so to speak, and the kind of oversimplified way of looking at the world that's not taking into account how we're making meaning. I think I just got myself off track. But what I was going to say is that the key for me is that we can make meaning, so we should reflect and look back at how we have made meaning in the past. And then remember that we can change how we make the meaning in the future if that's not working for us. And that's kind of how I describe the situation right now is that the meaning that's been made around race and justice and equality and equity is not working. 
And there's changes we can make in terms of how we talk about the meaning of these things. Exactly. And, you know, I think too, when we tell the stories, then people can also think about their own stories, right? Which is, I think, part of what you're getting at. Like, so, you know, it doesn't have to be like, oh, here's a big theory and blah, blah, blah. But it could be more like, you know, you tell your own story. So like when I'm listening to Liz's story, I'm like, oh, right. And my, you know, grade school and middle school, there was like two black kids in each of those schools. Right. And, and, you know, I had no exposure. And I talk in the book about like going to really just to hang out with my mom at a daycare that she worked uh, in, in the, in the black part of Lexington and uh, starting to work there and also studying sociolinguistics at the same time. And so studying black English and then those things kind of congealed together in some way that was really um, interesting. And that started to just change the way that that I was thinking about things. And mm-hmm. then when I got curious to go back to the notion of curiosity, right? Yeah. Then I started reading a lot and thinking a lot and just, you know, looking at history and looking, you know, like pulling from all of these different um, areas. But people, you know, like anybody should be able to think about like, you know, what is your background, your story? in regards to these kinds of issues. And then, you know, that might start like just a little spark Mm -hmm. could happen. The other thing I wanted to say, based on what you were just saying, Abby, you know, this, the sort of right, wrong, black, white, you know, there's one objective reality, the, the, another like step in the sort of consequences of that is if there's just one reality, if somebody doesn't think like me, then they're just wrong. Right. So yeah. That's where I think the idea of meaning making or social construction of reality, mm-hmm. it, you know, helps you because you're like, okay, well, they're not wrong. They just, you know, have constructed a different world where mm-hmm. what they're saying makes sense to them. Yeah, I think that's the tool that helps you exist in the tension of differences in any area of life. Because if I can sit here and say, okay, well, I think this, but Diane thinks this, or I feel like things should be this way, but they're this way that helps you exist in the tension to, yeah, if, if you're really thinking that one of you is right and the other is wrong, then you're stuck and there's no like movement from there, I think. But if you have an idea that, okay, you've created meaning for yourself, I've created different meaning for ourselves. Let's be curious about each other's meaning. I do think the curiosity is key because I think you, you can be aware, but not be curious, yes. you know? And so if you're, you could, you could have learned about meaning making, you could have heard stories or, you know, known people with personal experiences or had your own personal experiences and still not be curious to learn more. Well, and also when you live in that sort of all white world, Mm -hmm. it could be, it is definitely curiosity, but it's also exposure. Like our whole society is set up for white people to just be off by themselves and not have to deal with anybody different than them. And I definitely remember having the like the the spark of insight thinking about um, my goddaughter who's african-american and i just i can't remember why it was maybe she was like trying to buy like some expensive shoes when she didn't have any money for her for her little daughter who was just a baby and i was like that's so stupid why are you buying like nikes for a a one-year-old or whatever it was and i just had this spark of like she literally lives in a different world than a, a different world of meaning, like what's important and how you're valued and how people judge you and, yeah. you know, all of these kinds of things. And, you know, it's easy for me to sit there and be like that, you know, that's so stupid, but there's, you know, but there's a lot of layers to that of like being seen as a good mom and being providing for your kid and, you know, what has value and what doesn't have value and, you know, all kinds of things. But my point is when you're separated out, you're not going to have that spark of insight Mm -hmm. because you're not going to have those relationships to understand like what's going on in in other people's lives and, uh, and get the full context of it. You're just going to like read some article in the newspaper and be like, why are these stupid young mothers buying these stupid shoes? Right? Like you don't, you don't, uh, you don't have curiosity. Yeah. You think there's one reality and you think yours is the only one and that other people are wrong. You, you don't think other people are fully human. So you don't really care. And then you're judgmental. And then you start to make decisions and be part of a world that makes decisions that then hurts those 
uh, people in very concrete ways. Yeah. Okay, that is all for part one of our conversation with Liz and Diane, but join us back here next week for part two. We will talk more about their book and explore some of the examples they use, which I think is really helpful. Their book comes out October 31st, and you can find it with the link in the description. The next turns I'd like to offer you between now and part two of this conversation are, of course, to consider the questions I've posted at the top of the podcast description, which are, what does it look like to meet people where they are? And at the same time, ask people to move forward with you, even when, and especially when, it feels uncomfortable. What is your background or story of your experience with race? And finally, how can we not only build awareness, but also generate curiosity and experience exposure to diverse ways of being and making meaning? As always, I am supported by the CMM Institute for Personal and Social Evolution. This podcast is one of many initiatives designed to move us one step closer toward that better social world, which today we defined as a more just world. Finally, some additional podcast-specific next turns that I'd like to offer you are to share this episode or any episode you've found meaningful with someone you want to invite into the conversation. And of course, please feel free to keep the conversation going by reaching out to me. I love to hear from you and you can connect with me through email, the website, or Instagram and YouTube. You can find links to all of those in the description as well. Thank you for showing up. Thank you for being curious and thank you for being a part of this story. I'm Abby, and this has been Stories Lived, Stories Told. 